we thank thee so much for each member of this class and for the time we will have together, God willing, this semester. We pray that as we spend these hours together studying what the Puritans have taught, particularly in the area of systematic theology, we pray, Lord, that they would have so much to teach us that we would not be like those rebellious fathers spoken of in Psalm 78 who would not learn and listen and obey, but that we would learn from the Puritans how to live more godly in Christ Jesus and learn how to take theology and to apply it to our own lives so that it would transform us in our homes, in our families, in the marketplace, in our jobs, in the church, in every area of our lives. So do be with us, do bless us abundantly, and we pray, Lord, that uh, this may be a very helpful class for us, not only historically and theologically, but also practically. So be with us, we pray, and bless us. And do bring Joseph safely to us, and make everything well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, uh, quickly uh, say a few things about the syllabus here. Um, this course and the next catalog will actually be listed under the systematic theology section. <coughs> Present catalog is listed under the church history section. Uh, it's not meant really to be a church history course. We'll say a few things, of course, about the times the Puritans lived in at different points, but it's really a theology course that runs all the way from prolegomena to eschatology and then takes all of what the Puritans are teaching and says, how do we use that in our daily lives? How do we make use of that practically? Um, so the course description is an in-depth examination of some major themes of Puritan theology, including the view of scripture, meditation, election, adoption, assurance of faith, sanctification, conscience, casuistry, church and worship, preaching, promises of God, experiencing God, marriage and child rearing, and other practical areas as well. And there you have a list which you can read on your own of course learning objectives. Um, and the primary text is a Puritan theology, doctrine for life. Um, some of my lectures, I'll be just giving you a summary of a few chapters. material. Um, I'm asking you to read about 40% of the book. And um, then some particular readings, as you can see below, from a couple other sources. If you're THM, um, I am adding the reading of John Owen or Jonathan Edwards depending on which book you've read before. If you've read both of those and you want to read another book, um, I'm, I'd be happy to give you permission for that as well. Um, the books that are listed in the primary source that don't have pagination right after them, the pagination that you're to be covering in week 14, reading that in week one, so you, the reading can kind of be go along with the lectures. So don't be alarmed when you see all those books listed. Um, a couple of them you're only reading little, little bits and pieces of. Um, I had Chris Inglesma run this through the, you know, he's got this system where he runs it through how many hours it will take. And a three credit hour course, which is 39 hours of lecture or 40 hours of lecture, is, um, means 80 hours of, of homework. So two to one is the, is the basic relationship. So it's 120 hours all total. And um, I adjusted the reading until we got it to be 120. So you, you, you're, not, you're not having an inordinate amount of reading. Course grading, you see that on the bottom of page three. Final exam, uh, 30%. Final paper, 40%. Book review, 10%. And completion of reading and its assignments, 20%. What that last thing means is on your final day, on your final exam, if you just put um, at the top of it, what your, um, 
how much how much how much of the reading you completed. That's at the very end at the, uh, on the exam day, um, and then if you completed ninety two percent of the reading, I'll give you ninety two percent for that twenty percent. So that should be if you keep up, it should be automatic that you you get hundred percent on that that part because you should you should be able to do all the reading. Uh, I, think I think I have the wrong syllabus because it doesn't mention book review online. It doesn't? It does not, sir. Yours either? Yes. Oh, dear. Um, it has completion of reading and discussion 20%, final exam 30, final paper 50. Okay. Let me, um, I'm not sure if I changed it, which way I changed it to, if this is the old one and you got the new one, or I, I think you probably have the new one. But um, just sit tight on that for one day. I'll check that out. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And then what does it say for THM? 60% final paper, 20% book review, 20% reading? It doesn't have anything for THM. It doesn't have anything for? He didn't upload the syllabus huh? to THM. Jonathan didn't upload the syllabus to the THM during the test. OK. Okay, maybe maybe you have the old one and he just did, I sent it to him, but maybe he didn't see it and didn't upload it. Okay. Um, almost everything else will be the same. So, um, does it say dates beneath that? Beneath the, the the final, does it say dates? Class will not meet. Yes. February 11 and 12, 18 and 19. Yes. It does say that. Okay. All right. Paul Smalley will take the class on February 11 and 18. And since the final exam will be a take-home, I uh, will make up for February 12 and 19 by teaching May 6 and 7 at our regular time. This is a new idea, but uh, instead of giving you an exam in the last week, there's a lot of material to remember. I'm going to give you an exam a couple weeks ahead of time, and you can take it home, and you can, you can read it, which means it will be a little bit more demanding because you've got to study for it, but it will keep you from panicking that you've got to remember all these things in your mind. However, the better notes you take in class, since 80 to 90 percent of the exam will be on the lectures, the better notes you take in class, the better you'll do on the exam. Um, but I've just been to take two classes, and I'll give him my notes for those two classes, February 1 and eight, 11 and 18, <laughs> and I'll make up those last two lectures by lecturing for you on May 6 and May 7, which is exam week but they'll just be regular lectures to finish off the course. Does that make sense? All right. But I'll get back to you tomorrow on the other thing. The other thing I want to say um, on, the, on the, the final percentages, the other thing I want to say is um, there's a section in here that talks about doing a couple questions from questions I'm giving you on... Uh, the Puritan Theology book. I'm about a day away from completing that. If I don't have it for you tomorrow, I'll have it for you next week, Wednesday. I'm going to actually give you a list of questions, um, anywhere from five to ten questions for every single chapter, and then you can pick out of that what you, what you want to do, uh, just short answers. Uh, that will help you also with your reading, and uh, you can pick what you want, so can do things that are interesting to you. Um, and then uh, hopefully in the next printing of Puritan Theology, I'm going to uh, print these Q&A, or the, rather these Q, in the back of the third edition so that uh, other people can benefit from, from it as well. And I'm hoping that a lot of people will, in different churches, will have little study groups and go through this massive book over a period of a couple of years and uh, really study the Puritans. It seems terribly warm in here all of a sudden. Is that my imagination? I think it's because we closed that window. Was it partially open before? It was? It was a yeah, like that's... Oh. Yeah. yeah. Professor, the region where you are is also a bit warmer than the region where we are. Yeah, but everybody's nodding their head, so everybody's warm. And the last thing you want in class is warm students. <laughs> Spurgeon said... Make them cold. It'll keep them awake. <laughs> um, I don't know if we can do something in the back, too, with a little more. 
Oh, it is very, very warm. But for BC? Yeah. We will have a midterm exam. I don't think so. Okay. No. I don't have that down, do I? I'm asking only to confirm uh, because I, I read the, uh, the syllabus right now. I, I didn't receive this before. Okay. Yeah. Okay, help is on the way, as George Bush would say. <laughs> you don't understand that, most of you, because you didn't have, most of you aren't from America. When he ran for political office, that was one of his, George Bush's most famous statements. Help is on the way. I'm coming. Help is on the way. <laughs> okay. Um, let's then begin, unless you have other questions. I've... Uh, got a lecture outline there for you, and uh, the extra lecture outline is quite detailed, and that will help you in taking notes as well. The first lecture, however, um, you're going to think the first couple lectures were going very, very slow because I'm going to spend probably a day and a half just on point one introduction because uh, there's a lot to say under, under these points, but then we will pick up speed in terms of, of, of the outline. So what do we mean by Puritan? Well, many people today use the term Puritan to describe some kind of a morose, uh, legalistic brand of Christianity that borders on fanaticism. Um, if someone in America says to you today, oh, you're just a Puritan, they probably don't mean really kindly. Uh, I take it as a great compliment, but nobody else does. <laughs> Historically, the term was first used in the 1560s, also as a term of reproach. And William Perkins, it's often called the father of Puritanism, called it a vile term that described people with perfectionist tendencies, and he said, that's not us, and so he was insulted by it. By the time Perkins died, he, um, everybody was calling them Puritans, and he actually embraced it and said, well, I don't like it in some ways, but it is true, it is true that we are trying to purify the Church of England, and so Maybe we should just embrace the term, and that's what they did. So the term, then, is really used of those people that felt that the Elizabethan settlement, remember Elizabeth reigned from 1558, uh, was it to 1603, I believe, that 45-year period, which, by the way, coincides basically with uh, Perkins' life, 1558 to 1602. Um, the Puritans were determined to take the Reformation further than the Elizabethan settlement. Elizabeth wanted to come about two-thirds of the way to the Reformed convictions. And the Church of England has always sort of been a, kind of a halfway house between Rome and a full-fledged Reformed Church. Now, you could debate the percentages here. Many of the Puritans thought that the Church of England was just as much Romish as it was Reformed. But if you read the 39 articles of the Church of England, it kind of raises your eyebrows because you read those, you say, wow, this is really quite reformed. It's like 95% of the way. But in terms of some of the practices of the daily walk of life and some of the superstitions among the people, they probably weren't quite as far along the way as um, the 39 articles were. But when you're in a movement and you feel strongly about the movement, you tend to exaggerate how far away the other movement is. And um, 
I think some Puritans did that. They said it's, it's only half reformed, but I, I do think it was a good two-thirds uh, reformed in the Church of England. Um, but there was a lot of shallow preaching, unqualified preaching, not heart-searching preaching. The Puritans certainly had a point that the Church of England was not nearly as reformed as uh, the Genevan Church and some of the Continental Churches. And so these people who wanted to purify the church, purify the worship, uh, they are the ones that became called Puritans. Whether or not they left the church, okay, there were different kinds of Puritans. Some, some stayed in the church, like William Perkins, and said, we'll suffer these things that we don't agree with because we don't leave the church lightly. Then there's another group of Puritans that left the church, uh, think of the New England Puritans in Massachusetts, and yet considered themselves bonded to the church, but just were grieving that the church wasn't reformed enough and wanted to worship with liberty of conscience. Then there were other Puritans who were more radical and said, we want to leave the church completely and we don't ever want to return, wash our hands of it, it's an apostate church, we're, we're out of here. Those would be the pilgrims, for example, um, and it would also be um, uh, people that are called radical Puritans, some that went to the Netherlands, the Brownist, for example, um, and some of the Anabaptist movement would have, would have radically left the uh, Church of England. Uh, not that they were large numbers, but there were some. So kind of disparate groups, even a couple militant kind of radical Puritans, which are pretty much forgotten today because they didn't write many books and they're kind of off the wall. Um, they would be in that group. So think of the Puritans not ecclesiologically as one group, but think of them bonded together as a group of people that wanted to really purify the church whether it's the Church of England or whether it's a new, a new church. Now, the negative connotation um, from the word Puritan was felt strongly by the early Puritans because the word Puritan really derived from a translation of the Latin term catharsis or catharis, catharis, sorry, in the plural cathari. Um, singular and then plural. And that was a title that was given to medieval heretics. And so that's what made it so offensive to, to Perkins. Um, there were medieval heretics who had these kinds of perfectionist tendencies and thought they could be perfect. And they were called Cathari. And from that, the term was translated Puritans. And so Perkins and others felt it was a misrepresentation of their, of their views. Uh, Leonard Trinterut concludes in his uh, well-known book, Elizabethan Puritanism, throughout the 16th century, this term was used more often as a scornful adjective than as a sub substantive noun. Puritan with a small p. You're just a Puritan. Um, and was rejected as slanderous in whatever quarter it was applied. Now then, the term stuck, and we can't get away from it now, even if we wanted to. And the real question then becomes, the more important question, what is the mainstay? What is the central issue the Puritans are trying to correct, or what's their central dogma? And this is where scholars differ a great deal. 
uh, William Holler, who's quite a good Puritan scholar, um, says the central dogma of Puritanism is an all-embracing determinism theologically formulated as the doctrine of predestination. Well, I've been reading Puritans all my life, and I can think of one or two maybe who wrote a fair bit on predestination. Actually, the Puritans didn't, didn't write that much on predestination, and they were no more deterministic than any other Reformed group. So that's hardly their unique distinctive. Perry Miller, who was one of uh, three or four secular historians back in the 1920s who began to resurrect um, some good thoughts about the Puritans in the midst of all that 19th century garbage from people like Nathaniel Hawthorne and his Scarlet Letter and men who did so much damage to the Puritan cause such that people still today think of Puritans, think of things like this that are 150 years old and way, way outdated. Um, Perry Miller said, the marrow of Puritan divinity lies in the idea of the covenant. The covenant. And he believed that the Puritans used the idea of covenant, which of course we'll be talking about in the next three hours in covenant theology class, used the idea of covenant to to soften the rigors of predestination, take off the sharp edges. Now, I happen to think that Perry Miller was about 85% wrong, and maybe 15% right. Um, I don't think the Puritans consciously went out and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to emphasize the covenant now to take off the sharp edges of predestination. But they did stress the covenant a lot, more than predestination, because they really, really were very concerned to express how God relates to man. And the covenant is a, a wonderful vehicle in Scripture to explain how God and His people relate to each other. I will be your God, you shall be my people. That's covenantal language. So the Puritans do have a great emphasis on that. On that. I'm not prepared, however, to say that that was their central dogma. It was a major dogma, probably more major than predestination in their thinking. But um, there are bits and pieces of truth to almost all of these emphases, but uh, it's hard to pin on the Puritans one particular central dogma, just as it is hard to pin it on John Calvin. And I still remember sitting in the Westminster Seminary class and Dr. Claire Davis, uh, my church history professor who, by the way, he taught church history without any notes. Um, how he managed to do that, I don't know, but he had it all, all up here. But in terms of following through in order in church history, he was a lousy teacher because he was bouncing all over the place because, you know, no notes. In terms of summarizing whole movements in one or two sentences and gripping you with his wisdom about understanding a whole group of people, he was great. Well, um, Dr. Claire Davis uh, used to say the reason that nobody could ever really get John Calvin pinned down to say, what is your one central dogma is because John Calvin was such a scriptural theologian. And scripture doesn't have just one central dogma that nobody can pin it down on him. Those scholars have tried over and over and over again. I once did a study of that theme, actually, and I discovered that there were 20 different ideas among scholars about what the central dogma of Calvin was. I think they're all wrong. Because Calvin was a biblical theologian. I think Dr. Davis is right. But I would, I would say it's the same thing with the Puritans. They're such biblical people that they didn't let one doctrine govern, govern all their theology. Um, Alan Simpson, Alan Simpson, 
I wrote a book called uh, Puritanism in Old and New England. And he says the central idea of Puritanism is conversion. Conversion. How does a man get converted? What are the marks of conversion, fruits of conversion? In terms of volume of what they wrote, though they wrote a lot on covenant, more than on predestination, they wrote even more on conversion than on covenant. And so Simpson maybe is closer yet to, to, to coming to some kind of truth here. Um, the Puritans were very concerned about how to live the Christian life. It wasn't just to examine whether or not they were converted. It was that. But it was also they were very concerned about assurance of faith. Did you know that of the 100 Puritan divines that attended the Westminster Assembly, 27 of them wrote books on faith or faith and assurance or conversion? That's a lot. 20% of your people coming to one of your synods or assemblies wrote on the same subject. So the Puritans are very concerned about this. This is a primary emphasis. Christopher Hill, who, by the way, is a, um, a bit of a, a, a communist in his own background, emphasized that social and political ideas, social and political ideas, was the center of Puritanism. Well, that's in his book, Society and Puritanism. Um, the Puritans were very concerned about renovating society socially. And they very, were very concerned about political things, that the king wouldn't rule the church, for example, um, and that the state religion would be thoroughly reformed. But this is by no means the center of all their thinking. And then John Coolidge, um, in his book, uh, the Pauline Renaissance in England, Puritanism and the Bible. He said that the central emphasis of the Puritan was a rejection of the Anglican doctrine of adiaphora. Adiaphora, meaning things indifferent. See, the Anglicans said, well, there's a, a number of points of theology that are indifferent. The Puritans were quite precise. So the Anglicans accused the Puritans. They said, what's wrong with you guys is nothing is indifferent in your system. You've got opinions about everything, every little thing. And so they, the Puritans kind of irritated the Anglicans that way. And uh, you probably know the story of uh, one of the Puritans, John Rogers, and he's riding, he's riding his horse one day, and he... Um, He's riding with an Anglican. And the Anglican looks at him and says, as they're riding horseback, you can just see him galloping down the lane together. He says, I got a question for you, Mr. Rogers. Why are you so precise in all of your lifestyle? And Mr. Rogers says, well, sir, I serve a precise God. And Coolidge is picking up on things like that, saying that's the difference between Puritanism and Anglicanism. So Puritans really are just concerned about precision. In fact, in the Dutch tradition, the Puritans often became called precisionists. Um, men like Heisbertus Vucius, who followed the Puritan emphasis quite a bit, uh, was called a precisionist by the Coxeans and others in their circles. Well, the Puritans were precise because they believed that the Bible did give guidelines for almost every area of life, and they didn't have many areas of adiaphora. They did have strong opinions, and once in a while, some of them did lean a little bit legalistic, perhaps in certain areas. But this is by no means a center part of their thinking. wanted to live all of life to the glory of God. And so they were more careful. 
possibility that the essence of Puritanism was its piety, a stress on conversion, an experiential, heartfelt religion. Well, that's an incredible sentence, or it's two sentences, I guess. Because what Hawkins is doing is he's packing together in these couple sentences almost all the possibilities. And I'd like to say to you that all of these concerns, though not one of them is a center of Puritanism, all of these are very much wrapped up in Puritanism and probably... If I had to pick one of all of them, I would pick the last one. Puritanism was concerned about this purity, purity and all purity in the real vital relationship. So, the word which would be different emphasis. Puritan system, it wasn't in the area of misery, just what you experience with deliverance. There was a even greater and that's just an experience in a lifestyle of gratitude. So that is much, much broader than that. It's all life transforming. And I would try to summarize it in five major, having five major concerns. Uh, number one, Puritanism at its core at its core, is a concern to search the scriptures gather up one high scripture of life. Gather up your findings and apply it to every area of life. So Puritanism was always, first and last, biblical. Always confessional, always reformed, and always theological. See, that's one of the great differences between Puritanism and, and German Pietism. German Pietism wasn't as theological. It's more like how to live the Christian life, but theology is not so important. To the Puritan mind, theology, head knowledge, and heart knowledge, piety, and, and then put it into action with your hands. Head, heart, and hands. The whole man was equally addressed. And the idea of piety that, well, the head's not very important because the heart's the main thing, that's not Puritanism. Puritanism is the head and the heart and the hands. It's all important. Oh, of course, head without heart is nothing. But you've you want to build your heart religion based on sound theology. So the Puritans valued education. John Bunyan's about the only Puritan I know of. There's just a handful of them that didn't get a thorough Oxford-Cambridge education. Huge stress on education. Puritans were very, very educated men. Uh, they all knew Hebrew and Greek well. And they were all scholars, uh, at least all those that wrote, maybe not some of the ones that didn't write, weren't quite so much. But um, this is a very educated movement. And sometimes people f forget that. All right, so that's number one, searching the scriptures and applying it to all areas of life, biblically, confessionally, and theologically. Number two, the Puritans were passionately committed to focusing on the Trinitarian character of theology. They never tired of proclaiming the electing grace of God, the dying love of Jesus Christ, and the applicatory pursuit of the Holy Spirit in the lives of sinners. Their fascination with Christian experience, and they were fascinated with Christian experience, was not so much motivated by an interest in the experience itself. But it was motivated, and this is often misunderstood, out of their intense interest to trace out the divine work of the triune God within them so that they could then render all the glory back to that triune God. It wasn't experience for experience's sake. It was experience 
so I could glorify God. And that's a very, very important misunderstanding of the Puritans. Today, when people read the Puritan books and they examine Puritan writings and they see how some of the Puritans struggled for assurance of faith and in our shallow, easy believism Christianity of today where everybody has assurance of faith, they look at the Puritans and say, oh man, they were so introspective. They were navel-gazing. They were just concerned about themselves. It was experience for its own sake and they completely misunderstand the Puritans. I first learned this actually from J.I. Packer when I was a teenager years ago because I was wrestling with this. And uh, Packer, I don't even know where he says it anymore, but he says something exactly like this. The Puritan's passion was God. God and God's glory. And so they wanted their experience to glorify God. They wanted their um, husbandly duties to glorify God. They wanted their wifely duties to glorify God. So this emphasis on experience was not just for itself, but was all to glorify God, to triune God. And in this, of course, in some ways, in some ways, Calvin was their predecessor and laid the seed. Because Calvin was called the theologian of the Holy Spirit because he had such a focus on the Trinity rather than just the Father and the Son. And the Puritans picked up on that, you see. So the Puritans are very, very focused on Trinity. And so they're constantly referring in their writings to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Number three, in common with the Reformers, the Puritans were strong churchmen. Even when they left the church, they were still strong churchmen. They believed in the significance of the church in the purposes of Jesus Christ. And they believed, therefore, that the worship of the church should be the careful outworking and the faithful embodiment of the church's biblical faith. And that's why Puritanism was a movement that focused on plain, earnest preaching, on liturgical reform, and on spiritual brotherhood. Plain and earnest preaching, liturgical reform, and spiritual brotherhood. And likewise, the Puritans believed that there was an order or a polity, if you will, for the government of the church revealed in Scripture. And in this area, they debated endlessly among themselves as to exactly what that polity was. But they all believed that God had a certain order, a certain way he wanted the church to be run. 85, 90% of them were Presbyterians. Uh, maybe 10 to 15% were independents, like John Owen and Thomas Goodwin. At the Westminster Assembly, the independents probably spoke, even though there was only uh, seven or eight of them there, they probably spoke 30%, 40% of the time. And uh, they tended to be long-winded in some of their speeches, which greatly provoked the wrath of Robert Bailey, the Scots Presbyterian who wrote the minutes of the assembly. And uh, he got very irritated with them because they were taking too much time. And um, Their emphasis on independentism, those six, seven men, um, as great as theologians as some of them were, like Thomas Goodwin, uh, became an irritant and sort of an obstacle at the assembly. And I'm a, I'm a great Goodwin fan, so it hurts me to even have to say that. But Goodwin was too talkative. Wayne Spear did, um, did a study of all the Westminster Assembly minutes, and um, he concluded that um, he put a check mark beside each time one of the Puritans gave a lengthy speech in that five-year period. And uh, Goodwin was by far the most at if I remember right, it was 357 times he had lengthy speeches in those years. 
and the next one was like 200, and then the, the third one was like 100. So the, Goodwin must have, people must have stood to see him stand up and go, oh, no, not Goodwin again. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, the point I'm trying to make here by intro is just that all of them were concerned about good government of the church, even though they had disagreement among themselves. Number four, in the great questions of national life presented by the crises of their own day, the Puritans were always looking to Scripture for light. Light uh, about the duties and the power and the rights of the king and parliament and uh, the subjects who were, of course, the citizens, citizen subjects. And then number five, with regard to the individual, the Puritans believed with Christ that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So they excelled at preaching the gospel in which they would probe the conscience, seek to awaken the sinner, call him to repentance and faith, lead him to Christ, and school him in the way of Christ and sanctification. Puritans believed with James that faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So they developed from Scripture a careful description of what a Christian ought to be in his inward life before God and all his actions and relationship in this life, at home, in the church, at work, and in society. So then, when we talk about Puritans in this Puritan theology course, I'm using the word Puritan as a combination of all five of these concerns. And so we're talking not only about those Puritans who were ejected from the Church of England by the infamous Act of Uniformity of 1662 when 2,000 ministers gave up their living in one day because they could not go along with the enforced rules of the prayer book. But also those Puritans in England and North America who from the reign of Elizabeth I all the way until 1689, when finally freedom of worship was granted, who worked all those years to reform and purify the church from within to lead people toward godly living consistent with the reformed doctrines of grace. All right, so that definition of Puritanism that I'm using is broader than what some technical scholars use today. There's not always agreement. Randall Peterson, my, my friend and uh, co-author of Meet the Puritans, just did a doctoral dis dissertation on really what is Puritanism, and um, that's, that's quite enlightening. He's, I think he's broken some new ground there. But you see, there's, there's, there's men today, scholars today, who don't have much appreciation for the experiential emphasis of the Puritans. And, uh, or the spirituality. And they will simply define Puritanism as people that wanted to purify the church, who left the church. And so um, Stephen Yule and I are presently writing what we thought was the very first book ever, first biography ever on William Perkins. Because we're, you know, we're reprinting William Perkins. We're doing it in 10 volumes. We believe it will revolutionize uh, Puritan studies around the world. Uh, I just got a letter from Ian Murray yesterday. He, I sent him volume one complimentary copy, and he said he didn't ever think he'd see it in his lifetime. Um, and so this is a monumental thing to come out with the father of Puritanism in 10 volumes. So Stephen Ewell and I are putting together a biography 
just a bite-sized biography that I think Evangelical Press does it, yeah. Or Christian, yeah, Evangelical Press is going to do it. And it's just like 128 pages. It's not a, not a scholarly thing. We just want to introduce the average intelligent layman in the church to William Perkins and then have them hopefully want to read his writings. And so we got the first draft done, and all of a sudden, about two weeks ago, I pick up a, a flyer and notice that there's a guy in England who just published with Oxford the first biography of William Perkins. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Well, my first that was my first reaction. My second reaction was, wow, this is great. I can really learn a lot from this, and maybe we need to you know, go back and look at our book and make a whole bunch of changes. So we, we wrote for the books right away, sent them right away. Well, they arrived last week, and uh, I shot one off to Stephen Yule, and, and to my horror, he's arguing in his book that Perkins is not even a Puritan. Oh, no. Where are we going now? You know, but, but how does he come up with such a crazy thing? The father of Puritanism is not a Puritan. Well, he's got a very narrow definition. So he looks at it strictly ecclesiastically, Puritan. Perkins did not leave the Church of England. So he's not a Puritan. End of discussion. So the theological content, the practical plain preaching, the searching of the conscience, the altogether different emphases than the Anglicans with all their flowery and ornate preaching and lack of experiential emphasis, that means nothing to a scholar like this. And to me, you throw an old book in front of me, I can tell you in 10 minutes. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be stronger. I can tell you in one page whether I'm reading a Puritan or an Anglican. But you see, that's not the way they define it. So when you read stuff about the Puritans, you have to first ask, where's this author coming from? How does he see the Puritans? And I believe that you... you there's something that binds people like Ezekiel Hopkins and William Perkins who stayed in the Church of England with people like Thomas Hooker and John Cotton and, and other men, binds them together that's far, far bigger than whether they stayed in the church or, or, or left the church. And that is the Reformed, experiential, heartfelt religion and the emphasis on purity in all areas of life. So Peter Lewis, Peter Lewis says, Puritanism grew out of three needs. First, the need for biblical preaching and the teaching of sound Reformed doctrine. That's an important need because there was so little sound preaching. You know, you know what Elizabeth did. I, I, it's, it's unbelievable. She, she had people write up homilies, which are like short messages of about 20, 25 minutes, maybe 30. And she hired someone to do that. And then they would pass it around to all the ministers in the Anglican Church. And um, she asked the archbishops to have all the ministers read that homily every Sunday for their sermon. Now, not all the ministers obeyed, and not all the archbishops insisted, because, you know, I mean, these Anglican guys, they want to do something for a living and uh, just not read canned sermons. So a lot of them didn't do that. But that's what Elizabeth wanted, uh, even though she didn't always get her way. But a lot of them did do it, and they became totally inept at preaching after a while. They were very uneducated, and so they, wow. Well, I'll just go press the flesh a little bit and visit a few people, and come Sunday I'll have my sermon handed to me. Puritans have hoard that. So the need for biblical preaching, teaching of sound, reformed doctrine. Number two, the need for biblical personal piety, said Peter Lewis, that stresses the work of the Holy Spirit in the faith and life of the believer. And then number three, the need to restore biblical simplicity in liturgy, Vestments, that's what the minister wore. That's a, that's a whole story in itself. And church government. 
so that a well-ordered church life would promote the worship of the triune God. You see, Peter Lewis is coming from the same, same direction I'm coming from. He's saying these three needs pressed out, teased out this emphasis that then became known as Puritanism. And uh, people couldn't help but speak out in these directions. So in summary, doctrinally, Puritanism is a kind of vigorous Calvinism, robust Calvinism. Experientially, it's a very warm and contagious brand of Christianity. Evangelistically, it's tender yet aggressive at the same time. It's tender in the sense that it calls all sinners to come to Jesus Christ with great tenderness. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth. Oh, how many, how many Puritans preach in that sermon, that text? Amazing. But it's also aggressive. They won't let you go. They won't let you escape. Uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of people were converted under Joseph Alliance, an alarm to the unconverted. And Richard Baxter, a call to the unconverted. Those two books converted tens of thousands of people under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. Because they combine this tenderness and this aggressiveness in evangelizing. And in their day, they were called tracts. You know, for the Puritan to write a 150-page book was like writing a little tract. Uh, here's a little evangelistic tract. By the way, it's only 150 pages. So they were very evangelistic though they didn't call it evangelistic. Uh, and ecclesiastically, they were theocentric and worshipful. Doctrinally, vigorous Calvinism, experientially warm and contagious, evangelistically tender yet aggressive, ecclesiastically theocentric and worshipful. And politically, they aimed to be scriptural and balanced and bound by conscience before God. Now, I need to add, however, this footnote. Too often people see all the Puritans as a monolithic movement, as if they're all clones of one another. That is not true. That's not true any more than it was true of the Reformers, or for that matter, any group, major group of theologians in church history. The Puritans also had differences among themselves, not only ecclesiastically, which I've already mentioned, and politically, but even theologically. There were certain Puritans that imbibed some fairly serious errors. Not many, and the Puritans as a whole were probably more united than any other group I know of in church history, so that's true. But Richard Baxter was off the wall on justification by faith alone. Very unsound. Very good on practical things. But bad theologically. I would never reprint the complete works of Richard Baxter. He was a neonomian. Uh, John Preston, a good man, but didn't really believe in limited atonement. Uh, well, maybe that's an exaggeration a little bit, but it was more like Amiro on the atonement. Just, But for the most part, a remarkable unity of thought, conviction, and experience among the Puritans. Some areas, it's amazing how much they were like each other. I did an article on Puritan meditation. I got 41 books around me all written by the Puritans, on how to meditate. And basically every one of them was saying the same thing. And so it was a very easy article to write because you didn't have to deal with any oddities. And, uh, assurance of faith. Remarkable unity among the Puritans, for the most part. Just 
couple areas where there's some differences. So that's the summary then of uh, what do we mean by Puritanism. Any questions? Yes, sir. I think it's interesting when you were saying that, like Calvin, they really defy definition, but you come right down to it. Piety is right up there at the top. Yep. Um, and it, you could say the same for both. You couldn't really, if somebody's really biblical, you can't pin them to just one thing, but you know, piety is right near the top of the mountain. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But, but understanding piety in the sense then of a whole orbed, fully transforming, all consuming lifestyle. Yeah. 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 Uh, Calvin Calvin's said, one, one quick comment. Calvin said, um, the Christian's entire life, think about this, Christian's entire life ought to be one vast, unending exercise. In genuine piety. And that piety was then defined this way, an attitude of reverence and love toward God, fearing Him with a childlike fear. And so that attitude per permeates your whole life. So a life of piety is always asking, what does God really want me to do in this situation? How can I serve Him? How can I glorify Him? So it becomes God-centered. Uh, as one theologian said it, the Calvinist is God-obsessed. That's what the Puritans were as well. Everything was about God. Yeah, Flippy. But I've seen a professor once saying that the Puritans were very worthy in general. Very what? Worthy. They write too much. They, whatever they can say, if you could be said in 10 words, they'd use 15. What, how, what is your view on this? Yeah, um, it's true of certain Puritans. They are, some of them are wordy. Um, part of that comes from their desire to be thorough. When you read a Puritan, you see, when a Puritan expounds a text, like say, um, he will not break the bruised reed nor quench the smoking flax. Now, there's a Dutch Puritan by the, well, I say Dutch Puritan, but Dutch not a very fancy man, Similar in Puritan thinking, by the name of Schmeiteheld. And he writes 145 sermons on that text. I'd say, that's a, yeah, I'd say that's a little bit wordy, wouldn't you? Okay. Then you get Arthur Hildersham, who writes uh, 79 sermons on Psalm 51. And you say, how in the world can these guys do it? Or you get William Grinnell, who writes 1,200 pages on Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Or try Joseph Carroll, who writes 12 volumes on the book of Job that preaches on it for, what, 13 years. How do they do it? Well, here's the astonishing thing. When you read these books, there will be no repetition. Zero. So then you really ask, how in the world do they do it? Well, they have a different hermeneutic. The hermeneutic is they go into the text, say, here's the main doctrine of the text, and then they, then they um, expound that doctrine in the light of the whole of Scripture. So every text takes them to the whole of the Bible. And that's where they get very detailed. And that's why you can... Um, one advantage of it, of course, is they did so much pastoral counseling from the pulpit that they didn't need to see people privately, so it saved them hours and hours because they're dealing with cases of conscience in these different texts, dealing with actual concrete cases. We don't have time to do that because we've got to, we're, we're so shallow. We've got to flit from thing to thing. We've got people now that are taking 20 verses and, and packing, trying to do one sermon, trying to cover 20 verses. Well, you just skate over the surface, the Puritans would say. There's no depth there. Um, so that would be their view. Now you get other Puritans who are incredibly succinct in their language. Uh, take Thomas Watson. Man, it would take me 15 pages to write what he writes in one page. 
because every sentence is just so full of meaning and so short. So not all the Puritans are alike here either. So you're going to preach on communion of saints, right? And then one of your points you want to make in the sermon is, um, you know, if you really associate with the people of God, with really holy people, you will gradually become more like those people. So, dear congregation, it's good if you begin to develop friendships with other people that are really godly, if you want to be godly yourself. Okay? I just gave you one paragraph expressing one thought, right? Here's Thomas Watson. Association begets assimilation. Then you start thinking about that. Everything I just said, he said in three words. So some people love Watson because they say, every sentence i got to stop and think about it. Other people say, you know, he's so, he's so packed tight, he doesn't waste one word that actually frustrates me because I feel like I'm missing a lot because I, I know he's saying a lot, but I can't think it all through. So Puritans varied a lot. But what a lot of people accuse people of, Puritans of, is that they say things like this, well, Carol must have emptied out his whole church, preaching that long in the book of Job. But I've done some research on that, and that's actually not true. And besides, he didn't preach 13 years solidly on the book of Job only. He took some breaks. And on top of that, he averaged only three months, three sermons a month on the book of Job, out of the eight opportunities he had to preach every month. So it's easy to judge the Puritans this way. But this was acceptable in their culture, in their milieu, also in the educational method of their day, the Ramist method. The Ramist method was you take a truth and you divide it into two. Then you take that truth and you divide that into two and the other truth into two, and then you divide those two truths into two. So that's how you get subpoints and sub subpoints and sub subpoints. And their people were trained in that kind of education. So the average person in the pew could follow down to sub sub subpoints. Probably not sub 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 subpoints, that's getting a bit much, <laughs> but those three levels. Okay? So in the next class uh, on Puritan Covenant Theology, I was just studying this morning, Thomas Blake, the whole table of contents is written out in a Ramus method. You've got your main point, and you've got two bars going out, and there's two subpoints, and then there's two bars in the top one, two more subpoints, then two more, and two more. That's all written across the page as the table of contents. They were, they were even used to reading table of contents like that. Today, if you do that, you can have three points in a sermon, and you can have one layer of subpoints, and that's about it. You can't even get to sub subpoints because people can't follow you. They say, well, I, "I don't know where you're going," but we haven't been educated that way. Okay, so you have to tie all these things together, also socially, in the way they learned and they were educated, and then you begin to understand that the Puritan mind um, worked that way. So. Their congregation could love it if, if, if they did, if you did uh, 32 sermons on the book of Job. You know, they think that was great. That was a really profound preacher. He spent one sermon on each verse in the book of, Ju or a book of Jude, I said, should say. Did I say Job? I meant Jude. 31 sermons on the book of Job, that would be quick. Um, but you see, my, my point is this. You've got to understand, and you can't duplicate them, the Puritans today. All right, I, I have a friend. I, I'm not going to say where he lives because I don't want to give away his name. But the guy has spent like seven years on the book of Luke, and he's only on chapter 10. And he happens to be a very interesting individual. He's preaching very much Puritan style, and his congregation loves him. But I, I just don't know how. I, okay, just kind of hold my lip. But if he keeps going this way his whole life, I think they're going to get tired of it. One pastor, friend of mine in Brazil, uh, spent uh, almost five years exposing the Lord's Prayer in his church. After that, that series, this church session asked him to seek other church. 
<laughs> yeah. Be because they are not prepared for yeah. this uh, yeah. season today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and, th and these men are the exception. These men are the exception. Uh, you know, Lloyd Jones also had this kind of style where he spent years and years and years. And he could get away with it and be successful at it. And he was gifted at it. But, but few of us are Lloyd Joneses. But today, the, the trend, I think, is the opposite extreme, where we preach very shallowly and, and just brush over whole chunks of Scripture. And um, I think we need to take our people a little deeper. Yeah. I have another question. Sir. Sure. At the beginning of the class, you mentioned uh, on um, the accusations that they have received on their time. Uh, would you say, in your opinion, that some of those accusations, however harsh they may have been, or some of them that were not so harsh, do you think that the Puritans actually deserved some of them, or do you think that they were entirely, or almost entirely, out of out of place? They were absolute nonsense. Because I have heard many accusations, and I would like to get an opinion from yeah. you. Which accusation well, actually makes sense? Your, your, your question is too general for me to answer in too much detail because it depends what accusations. There are certain Puritans in certain areas, of course, who went too far insisting on particular, particular things. But there were also a lot of people in that society who wanted complete license and freedom to do everything. And the Puritans lived in a society, don't forget, where everyone believed in God, and everyone had to belong to the state church. So everyone was supposed to be mostly Reformed. And uh, what's remarkable about the Puritans is how godly they lived. And uh, yes, we can berate their failures, and they did have some failures, and they were excessive in some ways. Uh, at times, certain ones of them. Others you can't find, you can't hold a candle to anything. But so there's a lot of variety there. But my opinion is that we can berate their failures, but who among us is going to be as godly as the Puritans? Let us stir each other up because they are just tremendous examples for us in terms of godliness. And I, I do get accused sometimes of. Uh, uh, hagiography, because I don't say a lot of bad things about the Puritans. But I don't think I'm guilty of hagiography. I may be guilty of a little bit of a bias because of the way I was brought up. I was brought up very much in the Puritan way, uh, at least in many respects, and uh, learned to love that way, learned to love that emphasis on godliness. But often what you find is it's the ungodly people that are accusing the Puritans, or the Anglicans, who are fairly close, but feel guilty in their consciences that they're not like the Puritans and they're, 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 they're reacting by um, accusing them of things. And you know, that's, that's quite natural. I mean, if I've got friends who are more conservative than I am, um, your natural tendency is you want to accuse them of something so that you can quiet your own conscience. That, that's human nature. All right, our time is up already. We will uh, pick up from here tomorrow. My goal is to finish uh, point one tomorrow. And uh, I'll, I'll focus on C and D. Do I have an E on, on, on your outline, basic Puritan history? I do? Okay. Yeah. I probably won't be doing that because um, that's, this is a, more of a theology class, and you, you can get that anywhere you, anywhere you uh, read. All right, whose turn is it to close with prayer? This class will start up front. Uh, Billy, you want to close, please?
Amen. Okay, I'll see some of you back here in 15 minutes, and we'll go for another three hours.